Hi, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. Intel have revised the stock cooler again, so we thought we'd update our assessment of it by building a representative rig and testing it out in various uh, situations to see whether it's a viable option for you to use in your build. It's obviously very tempting to make use of the parts that are supplied with the CPU that you buy. It can reduce costs and mean that you can perhaps afford a slightly better specification elsewhere. The two principal complaints about the old cooler were first that it didn't really cool well enough and secondly that it was far too loud as it tried its best anyway. Really these two problems were linked because the only way it could achieve adequate cooling was to run a small fan really fast and small fans running fast by their nature are pretty loud and intrusive sounding. Let's see if the new design solves those problems. The updated version now has a sort of shroud around the fan and there's a snazzy blue ring so it looks a little bit nicer. They've reintroduced the copper core to the heatsink since the last generation as a way to transfer heat off of the surface of the CPU more efficiently. It comes with a dab of thermal paste pre-applied to it so do be careful handling it before you fit it but it does mean you get everything you need in the box if you're buying a non-K CPU. Mounting it actually seems a little easier than before. The thumb pins appear to have been redesigned to engage more cleanly, and we had no issues fitting it. Just be sure that each of the clips locks home so you get good contact. This ensures good mounting pressure, with the CPU cooler fitting onto the surface of the CPU cleanly. Our test PC is a fully built setup in an enclosed case. We wanted to generate a real world environment to test this cooler. We built the PC with an i5-12600, which adheres to the same power specifications as the other i5 non-K variants. We also paired that with the Asus B660M Tough uh, motherboard, an RTX 3060 Ti GPU. The case is the Corsair 4000D non-airflow, and we fitted it with 320mm fans, one as exhaust and two as intake. We left the fan profiles as standard, as controlled by the Asus Tough motherboard, so they do respond to CPU temperatures. Overall, we felt that this was a representative setup and a PC configuration a lot of people would aspire to build right now. It's a really nice setup and a very powerful and capable 1080p or even 1440p gaming PC. For our testing, we did a couple of things. First up, for torture testing for the CPU, we ran Cinebench R23 on a 10 minute loop. This is an all core workload, demanding as much as the CPU will give, and it runs with uh, power limits removed at around 100 to 110 watts on this CPU, so that's the heat load that the cooler would have to cope with. We did also test with uh, multi core enhancement, or ASUS performance enhancement as they call it, off, which means that stock Intel power limits are applied. That means that it will run to 117 watts potentially for the first 26 seconds, and that then cuts to the long term power limit, which is 65 watts. The second test we ran was the 3D Mark stress test. This test is more akin to long-term gaming. That is, it runs at steady state with the graphics card fully utilized and the CPU actually under less stressful workloads. And what we wanted to see was whether the CPU cooler experienced any problems as the heat load in the case overall increased or whether it was able to achieve steady state cooling and maintain the temperatures of the CPU long-term. So let's see how the stock CPU cooler coped. First up, we tested Cinebench R23 with Asus Performance Enhancement enabled. We did this because as you can see, when you first set the PC up, it displays a splash screen that we think most people will simply press F1 to continue through, um, and that sets Asus Performance Enhancement and allows the CPU to run at a much higher power limit. You have to go back into BIOS and purposefully reset that power limit to adhere to Intel standard specifications. Therefore, we think the vast majority of people when building their PC would probably end up with this system running at full power by default. This is important, as we'll see shortly. Running this Cinebench R23 all-core test, the stock cooler did not fare well with Asus Performance Enhancement enabled. It's allowed to draw around 100 to 110 watts continuously, and this quickly overwhelms the capacity of the cooler. It survived a single run, but after that the CPU is at 100 degrees C, throttling, a little red light comes on the motherboard to tell you that you're being nasty to the CPU, in short, it's not good. With the fan at full speed, 3000 RPM, it was also very loud. We terminated the long-term tests after about five minutes. Despite logging throttling in Cinebench R23, it did still return very high scores, 13,400 points, and neither clocks nor power draw dropped. So it's worth being cautious when running this setting. It will allow the CPU to run full bore without throttling back either CPU clocks or power levels in response to the rising temperatures. We actually terminated this test because we didn't want to risk a thermal shutdown of the PC. The next option was obviously to disable Asus Performance Enhancement. This forces the motherboard to adhere to Intel's specified power limits. It allows a high limit, 117 watts for a short period of time, so the CPU can boost and get short jobs done as fast as possible. After a sustained load for around 26 seconds, the power limit is then cut to 65 watts and remains there for as long as the load exists. 
In this instance, the CPU did get hot initially, rising to 85 degrees Celsius, but the long-term power limit cuts in and so temperatures fall. So does the score. It nets 12,175 in a single run in this power restricted mode, and after 10 minutes load it runs the entire test at 65 watts and nets a score of 11,518. In the long term test, the CPU cooler is perfectly happy, with the 65 watt limit keeping temperatures down to around 73 Celsius. The fan is also consequently running at a lower speed at about 2100 RPM, and this is much more bearable in terms of noise. The standard power mode absolutely does limit the performance of the CPU, but it also keeps temperatures and noise down. The system's happy running indefinitely at this lowered power level with the stock cooler. Looking at a more forgiving and perhaps more realistic workload, we ran the 3 d Mark stress test which loops the time spy benchmark 20 times, which takes around 30 minutes to complete. This is analogous to steady state gaming loads on a PC. Because this test doesn't load the CPU that much, it's really about if the CPU cooler can deal with the heat load as the GPU works hard and also adds heat to the case. It did fine, with temperatures holding just under 60 degrees C irrespective of whether the stock power limits were applied or not. Temperatures didn't climb over the duration of the test. There was no appreciable impact on GPU temperatures. It was also tolerably quiet. So you could game indefinitely on the stock cooler with either power limit enforced and it really doesn't seem to matter overall, provided the CPU isn't under full load. If you run a more demanding game, or perhaps you're in a hotter environment, you might find that temperatures and therefore noise do increase over time. Ultimately then, this turns out to be more a test of really case airflow, and whether the case itself is passing sufficient fresh airflow to allow the CPU cooler to do its job. It's not so much a test of the cooler itself. So to conclude then, the stock CPU cooler is perfectly adequate, provided you're not going to subject the CPU to demanding all-core workloads, and also assuming that you're going to adhere to Intel's stock spec for power delivery. It's designed with that 65 watt maximum long-term load in mind. If you're going to run demanding workloads like rendering, video processing, or tasks of that nature, you really do need a more capable CPU cooler. Likewise, if you're going to lift power limits, and you will find many motherboards do actually default apply a higher power limit to achieve peak performance for the CPU, you could quickly find that you've overwhelmed the CPU. As you can see in our all-core testing, if you run it with power limits lifted in a demanding workload, you instantly spike CPU temperatures up past 1995 degrees Celsius, you experience thermal throttling, and in some instances you're going to experience perhaps a thermal shutdown of the PC as the cooler fails to keep with a 100 watt workload. I should note at this point that whilst it's not desirable, the CPU will still self-protect and shut down before damage is done to your components, but you could lose data. So using the stock cooler is a perfectly good way to keep costs down while you build your PC, and it will be adequate for the vast majority of users. However, if you are looking to improve the performance of your CPU, run lifted power limits or demanding workloads, you absolutely will benefit from a better quality cooler that you can buy on the aftermarket. A 4 heat pipe tower cooler with a 120mm fan tends to be around $30, and we think that's a really good investment if you've got that money to spare, just to make the usability and quality of life as you use your PC much better. You can run them with a much lower noise profile, or they'll keep temperatures low and performance higher if you do do demanding work with your CPU. If you're in a hotter environment, they're certainly a sensible idea, because they will allow the CPU to manage its temperatures better over long-term use. We've got results from testing a range of CPU coolers on this i5 CPU, so please do click like and subscribe, and you'll see that as soon as it's released. We really hope you found this video helpful, and who knows, perhaps it's saved you a handful of bucks as well if you've decided you can live with the stock CPU cooler. Please do also check out premiumbills.com, we've got loads of advice and guides on there to help you get the absolute best out of your next PC.